The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Glory to to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and tell his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you. If two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good evening, everyone. Just a word of welcome to to many of the Notre Dame families that are here present, and especially with their kids. Again, it's always a a great pleasure when we host you. You come from uh, this side of town, the better half of town. Amen? (laughs) So again, you're always welcome here at St. Mary's. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So something amazing happened just this last Wednesday. We started, or we've added, rather, a, an additional mass time to the normal daily, weekly mass schedule. So we started our, this just happened last Wednesday, the first 6.30 a.m. mass. And because when I first got here, I looked at all the different mass schedules at St. Joseph's here, I looked at Dixon, I even looked at Fairfield. And we all had masses around 8 o'clock. And so if you had to go to work or you had to go to school and you wanted to go to mass before, you didn't have a real opportunity. And so I felt, okay, let's, let's provide an opportunity because I think the answer to all of our problems is always more Jesus. We need more Jesus. When you look at the lives of the saints, you know how they always respond in times of crisis? More prayer, not less. And so, as, as your pastor, as your spiritual father, I said, well, I need to give you more opportunities to go. So I said, well, let's add an early Mass. And so we started, again, not knowing if anybody would come. We just said, hey, we added additional Mass time, 6.30 a.m., come. Since it was the first one, I thought, hey, if we get 15 people to come to a 6.30 a.m. Mass, Good start. Then word will start to spread. And so there we were. I was, a, I was, well, I was scheduled for that first Mass, and 6.20 came a.m. Like three people in the church. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, Lord. Oh, this is disappointing. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, just, it's just the beginning, right? You always start small with anything. And by the time I finished getting vested and we ring the bell to begin Mass, and, and I, daily Mass, we process out from the, from, the, from the back, that three had grown to 46. Praise Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus. 46 people came, 6.30 a.m., 
There were people dressed in scrubs, people dressed in nice in suit and ties, people who were about to go to work. We had students dressed up in their Catholic uniforms, students who were going to go, go to classes later on, but they got up early. And they came here. Now I'm thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not going to make any hasty decisions, but do, do I add more now masses to the mass schedule? Huh? Maybe make it more during the entire week now. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. Because if this deep desire here for an early mass exists, Let's do it. <laughs> Why would anybody get up to go to a 6.30 a.m. mass and then now when the time changes, it's going to be dark? Why would anybody do that? Many of you parents in here to have your kids on Notre Dame, or anybody in here with kids. You love your kids, don't you? Absolutely. You, you love your kids with all of your heart, mind, and strength. There, wouldn't, there isn't anything you wouldn't do for your kids. And even you know, when, when they grow up, especially when they become teenagers, and that's when they start to rebel, that's when life gets hard, because you're always, you're always trying to impart upon them, like, my rules, my expectations of you are for your good. And that's always hard to think, especially when we're teens. We always think, oh, mom and dad, you're always trying to control me. You don't want me to be happy. You know, the typical teenager arguments that we have, that we all had when we were growing up. But at the end of the day, every parent in here, why do you require all of the strict rules, seemingly strict rules, of your household. Love, isn't it? We love our children, so in order to love, it always requires sacrifice. Think about that for a moment. Love will always, not sometimes, not once in a while, but always. Love will always require sacrifice on our part. Why did the people wake up at 6.30 a.m. mass to go? Well, love. They got up early where they could have slept in happily, but they realized if I love Jesus, it will require something of me. I don't want to stay on that point because in the reading today from the second reading, Paul is speaking specifically about this. Paul now writing to the church in Rome. He says this, he says, Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves one another, loves the another, has fulfilled the law. And then he begins to lay out the Ten Commandments. He lays out a couple of them. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. Or the other ones, honor your mother and father, the fourth commandment, or the first commandment. You shall, have, you shall love the Lord your God and have no other gods above him. Or the third commandment, keep the Sabbath holy. And as Christians, for us, how do we honor the third commandment? Coming to Mass every Sunday. See, look at that now. Ooh. The third commandment of God, to come to Mass every Sunday. Why does God require these expectations of us? But let me ask you this another question in order to answer this one. Is God our Father? Answer it within your own mind. You don't have to yell it out. But is God our Heavenly Father? Did God create every single one of us? Did He not 
knit us in our mother's womb? Did he not call our soul into being? Did he not create us? Well, the answer obviously is yes. And if indeed God is our father, then what he requires of us, what he is asking of us, is that for our benefit? Yes. Just like you parents in here with your children. You love them. And you want their highest good. And that's why you lay out, you got to go to bed at a certain time. You got to eat your vegetables. You can't do this. You can't do that. You got to do your homework. You got to clean your room. You got to stop hitting your brother. <laughs> got to share your cookies. Why, why all these rules? Why? Because we're, our parents hate us? No. God gives us these commandments because he knows us. And he knows that it's for our highest good. To love. In the Christian way, this word love here in the gospel, or in the second reading, the Greek word is agape. There are four options for the word love in Greek. When Jesus brings in the word love, agape, he, for the first time in human language, this enters into our lexicon. First time. To love in Christianity, the definition of love St. Thomas, I think, put it beautifully. He said, to love is to will the good of the other. It is to desire the highest good of the other person. Notice that definition of what Christian love is versus what we totally, when we speak of love in the normal parlance of, of, of English, we think of love as feelings. Well, feelings are important, absolutely. But love at, 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 its, at its purest Christian definition has no reference to feelings. Rather, authentic Christian love is to desire the good of the other, even if they hate you for it. This is where the first reading in Ezekiel comes in. Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest in the 6th century B.C., and Ezekiel had the task to go to Israel, the people of Israel, and to call them back to the commandments. Because they had strayed from it. They started worshiping the other gods. They started sacrificing their own children to the false gods, all, all the most hideous ways. And so God gives Ezekiel a mission. Tell the wicked that they sh will surely die if they continue in their ways. Warn them to turn them away from their wickedness. He had the task of going to a people who had gone astray and to have them return to the ways of God. And how do you think they responded to Ezekiel? Well, they responded like a 15-year-old kid when you take away their telephone, <laughs> right? You ever had that argument with your kids? Multiply that by a thousand now. I praise and I look up to my brother priests in Mexico. In Mexico, as we know, there's, there's a lot of problems with cartels. And amazingly, there are courageous Catholic priests who speak against them there, which is now Mexico is the most dangerous place to be a Catholic priest. Do you realize that? Do you guys know that? The most dangerous place to be a priest is in Mexico. And you think, why, why Mexico? Well, Mexico is almost 90% Catholic. And yet it's the most dangerous place. You would think the most dangerous place in the world for a priest would be somewhere in, 
in the continent of Africa or in China, and it is hard there too for our, our fellow Catholics there. But Mexico. Because these faithful priests have the audacity to call them to repentance. How do you think they responded to that? Not good. In the last five years, we've lost about 20 priests. Why do they do that? The priests speak against them. Love. Love. They know they need, there, there are brothers and sisters in the cartels. There are brothers and sisters. There are, there are, in fact, they're part of our family. And we must call them to repentance. Stop what you're doing. To love is to lay down one's life for the good of the other. Even if they hate you for it. Does that type of love remind you of anybody? In all of our Catholic churches, you will always see the body of Jesus upon the cross. People make fun of us for that. Non-Catholics will make fun of us, telling you, oh, you Catholics, you keep Jesus on the cross. You... The reason why Jesus Christ will always be upon that cross. Because he's showing us how to live love. How are you and I called to love God? Like that. How are you called to love your spouse, your wife, your children? Like that. How are you called to love your enemies? like that. How are you called to love your priest when we preach too long? Like that. <laughs> My friends, the commandments of God, as hard as they are, requires us to take our ego to let it die. We must follow the commandments. Love God, have no other idols, keep the Sabbath holy, honor our mother and father, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet your neighbor's goods, don't covet your neighbor's wife. All of these commandments that he's laid out before us, as hard as they are, when seen as our father loving us, now do you see why we happily die to ourselves? <laughs>